Today we're at a full wedding day where we're going to use a lot of off-camera flash. You'll be on top of my camera and can see everything that I do. This is all of the photography of the wedding day. In tomorrow's video on YouTube, we're going to be editing through all of the images. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video if you like the video. If not, I don't... I don't. Here's the intro. Taylor Jackson shooting 67 weddings last year. Taylor Jackson, welcome. So Taylor, you are well known in this community. You're an amazing photographer. Welcome to another full wedding day. Uh, if you've been following this series, what happens is you're on top of my camera. You can see all the settings, everything that I take. You can see a lot of the behind the scenes, everything that kind of happens. My big nervous energy, I guess, when it came to getting started shooting weddings was the fear of the unknown that I didn't really know what a wedding day looked like. I didn't know start to finish what a wedding photographer should do. So I bring these videos to you in hopes to reveal some of that mystery so that you can be a little bit more prepared or not even necessarily prepared, but just a little less anxious going into the wedding day. Uh, I'm a very quiet, shy, introverted human being. So I'll never be the photographer out there like going crazy, doing crazy stuff. I'm a lot more photojournalistic in nature and I like to just document everything that I possibly can as kind of fly on the wall and then just to step in whenever I'm absolutely needed like family formals and photos with the couple. Um, uh, a, a, a huge announcement I guess. Uh, so if this is the first week of April that you're watching this video, uh, April 2020, starting April 1st until April 11th, I have the hugest, the, the biggest, the largest offering that I have ever done as a wedding photography educator. And if you sign up for Patreon just this single month, so you don't have to sign up for a full month or anything like that and you can cancel it anytime. If you sign up for Patreon this one single month, you get access to every single course that I have ever made, which means you get the Advanced Wedding Photography course, you get Book More Weddings 2020, you get Book More Weddings 2019, which is a completely different course, and 2018 and 2017, you get all my presets, you get an introvert's guide to wedding photography posing, which again, as I spoke to a minute ago, is kind of at least my strategy that I've figured out to be quiet and shy and still get the images that I need, as well as a full off-camera flash course as well. Um, specifically specifically off-camera flash for wedding days because I feel like off-camera flash is a lot different. We're going to talk about this a lot in this video, but I feel like off-camera flash is a lot different for wedding photographers because you can't just bring in huge modifiers. You have to rely a little bit more on bouncing light and being a little less obtrusive when possible. Uh, and then beyond that, you also have access to all of my Patreon content that has existed since the beginning of Patreon, instant access to all of that, including all my presets and everything else. There's a weekly podcast that's been going on pretty much a year now. And yeah, so it is the most overvalued. If, if this is the one time that you sign up, this is the most overvalued $30 that you'll ever spend in the history of time on wedding photography education. It's a little bit crazy, but it's a little bit crazy time right now. So I figured I would open this up to anyone that's stuck at home, anybody that just wants to learn more about wedding photography education over this week. If you're watching this video and it is past April 11th, um, I'll probably never be offering this deal again. So I apologize for for not ever offering it again, but it's one time only for kind of this first week and a little bit of April. Let's get to the wedding day where I talk about my shoes. Good morning, some exciting upgrades today. Uh, I've actually found shoes that are maybe the most wedding appropriate shoes that I've ever found. They're dress shoes on the top, sneakers on the bottom. In other fashion upgrades, I've actually discovered that Lululemon makes uh, men's dress shirts. So if you are a male and you're looking for a very breathable, uh, lightweight dress shirt for the summer months, maybe, uh, maybe check it out. Let's go photograph a wedding. Also, the only song that we will be listening to today is The Decline by No Effects. Unfortunately, I'm not able to license this super fast, high energy punk rock, so here's some piano ballads instead. You might also notice back here that there is a light stand, and that light stand is because we're going to be doing a lot of off-camera flash today, which if you've been following this full wedding day series uh, over the past year or so, um, is quite out of the ordinary because I rarely ever use flash unless I absolutely need to, but today we're gonna use a lot of it. All right, as we get to the actual wedding day, a bit of a disclaimer here. This video, or at least the wedding, was in June, so I was using my old Godox, or Godox, depending on how you want to pronounce it. I was using my old Godox equipment, um, so I was using different flashes than I currently use. The current flash that I 100% recommend is the Godox V1, and also the transmitter. Um, I can't find the transmitter, but there are links to them in the description below if you're interested in purchasing them. Um, it's the, the best flash system I've discovered. Prior to this, I was using either Pocket Wizards or I was trying to use kind of the built-in Wi-Fi or whatever it is, the IR, and I just never felt that it was 100% of the time always working. So by getting the Godox system, it really just kind of took me from hesitant, uncertain if my off-camera flash will never work, so I never wanted to use it in a pivotal moment to something that just 100% works all the time. So it really has changed and made me more excited about off-camera flash overall. So 
Godox V1, um, and you have to buy it for your specific camera system. So if you're a Nikon shooter or a Sony shooter or a Canon shooter, you gotta buy specifically for that. Um, that's all for now. Back to the wedding day. So I always use the 35 millimeter lens as a macro lens. Uh, I've, I've, for a long time, I used to bring all kinds of equipment with me to wedding day, and I found that it's just much easier to bring a smaller bag. I use the Peak Design Everyday Messenger, and I usually bring a 35, an 85, and a 7200, and those three lenses are all I bring to wedding day. Today, you can see that I am shooting this, or I guess you can't really see because I have a transmitter. Again, the current transmitter and the current flash system I'm using is in the description below. This here is the Nikon Z6. The Z6 is great. I, I believe, personally, this is my opinion. Take this how you want. The Z6 is a great camera as a second camera on your wedding day and part of your wedding day bag. Uh, I would not use it as a main camera simply because it only has one card slot. I'm hoping that in the future, maybe even a couple weeks from now, who knows when it will come out, but I'm waiting for that two card slot uh, Nikon Z series body and I'll be very happy to use it at that point. Until then, my main camera, uh, this is not my main camera that I'm using for, for this 35 shot, but my main camera is a Nikon D850 at this time. And moving into this wedding season, it's gonna be a Nikon D780. If you are just a photographer, even something back to the D750, is a totally reasonable camera to use for wedding days. So you don't have to go out and buy the latest and greatest because quite honestly, the latest and greatest that came out five, six, seven years ago is still really fantastic when it comes to photography. Where you are going to want to upgrade is if you are looking to do more videos, highlight films. Usually I am at a wedding day and I'm doing both photography and video coverage as myself and a second shooter. Uh, but today they've actually hired a third party video team that I have no affiliation with. And you might be like, what, what does this image even look like that you've been struggling with for a while? And I like the direct flash on the ring and it's lighting up just a little bit of the purple. And here is the photo. I thought that I would bring back the piano music to, to really up the, uh, the beauty of this. I feel like it's, it's one of those things that really audio does enhance stories, which is why I think videos connect so well with people when you're watching a wedding video that people get emotional, they cry. It happens sometimes with photos, but I feel like it happens more with, uh, with video. Cut the piano music. Tomorrow, we're gonna to be editing all these images, so you, all the images that you're seeing pop up on your screen. We're actually gonna go through individually each of these images tomorrow in a full editing video. And I will also recommend, if you are somebody that clicked on this video because you're like, I need a no off-camera flash, I might recommend for a lot of these shots, what I've been doing and what you just saw me struggle with for an unreasonably long time there, was to get one shot that if I just would've had a video light and I just could've seen exactly what I was doing, um, I really just could've made that process a heck of a lot faster. So if you're a wedding shooter, don't just automatically assume that, oh, off-camera flash is the solution to all of my problems. One of these little video lights, and you get the little, little ball adapter here to make it nice and soft, instantly you can kinda up one, I guess like, people if you ever need to light somebody in kind of a challenging space. It's a small, small thing, so you have to get it really nice and close, but it does create nice light. What it is going to be more helpful for is photographing something like this ring that we just did that I could just put this somewhere here. Um, this one specifically is actually really cool. Um, I might have just turned it off completely. There we go. So you can get you can get some like crazy, some crazy strobes if you want, not really applicable for weddings, but what I'm trying to show you <laughs> This is fireworks, so if, if you want that firework reaction shot, if you're if you're photographing um, like the fireworks and you're like, oh, I didn't get that video shot of the couple, you can hold this on them. And this is kind of like emulating what's happening, right? You see how that could be useful. Um, <laughs> it's a police car, little, little candle lit. So if, again, if you're doing video, it's kind of a moving, gets brighter and darker and kind of flickers a little bit. Um, kind of trying to show you, it only really works in darker, environments unless you get it really nice and bright. But the most important thing for at least me as a wedding shooter is uh, that you can control the Calvin of this. So you can go from something that's completely kind of white, I'll try to demonstrate on my face as best I can, to something that's quite orange. So if you're in incandescent lighting and everything is just orange, this works really nice. Um, ignore what's happening right now because I'm kind of in daylight. And as you kind of cool it down a little bit there and increase the Calvin to something like, you can go all the way, way up to 8,500 Kelvin, um, that now this is kind of, it's almost beyond daylight almost, because daylight is coming in through this window here, and it's a pretty good emulation of kind of what's going on there. And then as soon as you put on the little bulb, it just makes everything a heck of a lot softer. So if you're looking for that one light solution, like say for instance, um, I have actually Godox SL 60W lights over there. So that's the light that's kind of lighting me up. It's bouncing just off of my wall, but if I just need something, <laughs> again. But if I just needed something and it was nighttime and I just wanted to balance with the scene, this is just 
all from this little bulb here. So just by holding this kind of over top of my camera, like right in front of the lens here, um, it does a lot of great things. So don't believe that off camera light or off camera flash is the, is the way to go. That if you want to get a little more creative and you want to see what you're actually doing, something like this might be more up your alley and turn this light back on and let's go photograph some really nice shoes. Moving back to the struggle here, right now I am basically, uh, my overall strategy for getting set up for off camera light is number one, I want to expose for the scene in some way if I want it to be a shot that is a little bit ambient and then I want to bring in the flash to kind of accentuate that, make it a little bit different. Um, the one downside, so I spoke the, the praises of having a continuous light, uh, a video light that you can really do everything that you want. What you can't do, in this instance you would, almost get away with it. I feel like you'd really just kind of be at the max power of a video light. But as soon as you get outside, there's really no way that a continuous video light is going to overpower the sun. Where you can do that is with an off-camera flash. Um, there are some really powerful video lights that you can um, start to get some really good effects outside, but they're quite expensive right now um, and, and or not portable if they actually have to plug in. Um, so using this flash right here, I can definitely get all the power that I need. I feel like I'm nowhere even close to shooting this at full power. And this is the time of the day that I arrived a little bit maybe before I should have just to, to be around. And I have a little bit of free time to kind of play around and get these shots. Overall, I feel like these photographs are becoming less and less important to my couples. I don't know if that's an industry trend or if that is just myself, my own personal trend that I'm seeing that for the most part, at least that these images, specifically like the dress hanging shot just really isn't that important for a lot of my couples. So take stock and understand at least under, get it maybe out in the pre consult or on the wedding day and see how much they actually want these images. A lot of people are going to be at in your hands and like you're the professional you know what you're supposed to take and it doesn't really all come down to us and what our shot list is uh that it, it comes down a little bit more to what the client actually wants so knowing more about that going into the wedding you're going to make them a lot happier and you're going to take the images that they actually want captured on the wedding day and now i'm moving to a direct flash so i'm just have the flash really nice and close um no modifier just pointing straight at the shoes to try to see what kind of happens that I feel like a lot of this in the beginning is experimentation and creating new and unusual images. I think it's still very important to do the images that you've always captured that are in your portfolio. No, no surprises on the wedding day for your couple that you come in and your everything in your portfolio is natural light. And then all of a sudden everything's all flash lit. Uh, don't do that. But by just playing around a little bit, when you have some extra time, you will create images that are unique and interesting. And when you get back to your computer, you can, I guess, identify which ones are actually valuable and you can take those skills and go forward into next week with them. Um, if you are somebody that really is passionate about off camera flash, you can obviously do all of this at your own home. Um, I feel like that's one of the, the main benefits of off camera flash is that when you're doing it, usually you're in non ideal condition. And for the most part, all of our homes and all of our apartments or wherever you live is probably not the most ideal condition. So you can practice a lot when you're at home. You can practice a lot with small objects, large objects, find some shoes, get it all in your head before you actually get to the wedding day so you can set things up nice and quick. All right, to uh, give you a little bit of the payoff after watching me struggle for so long, that was the full unedited clip. So that's as long as I struggled for it. And here is what it looks like with absolutely no off camera flash. And here's what it looks like with that side light really nice and close. I think that both shots are good. I feel like a blend that's more of the two of them that you could have done with a video light because you don't need that flash intensity might have been the way to go. Um, but again, like you gotta, you gotta wait to get back to your computer. Like if you're just looking at the back of your camera, you're still in the scene. You're not really seeing what the images truly look like um, out of context. So that's kind of my takeaway and the way that I iterate and I improve every single week, most weeks at least. And if you're getting a little deja vu, I might have had this in an off camera flash video, maybe back in like July, August of this year. So if you feel like you've seen this specific scene right here, it, it's possible that you have. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to light from above. So I have my light on a flash stand here and I'm just going to hold it kind of directly above in a moment here. Not yet. Right now. Here it goes. Up, up, up it goes. And I think that this is kind of, I don't know, this is a very bro lighting move, but I do like the end result specifically just because of the contrast and kind of the impact of the red soles of the shoe. You can see the video team off to the, off to the left there playing with the flowers. Um, but again, you kind of have to know when to bring in that big in your face, contrasty pop of a photo, uh, versus going for kind of a softer look and feel. And you can do both within a gallery, but I really do feel like being focused more on one or the other or using off camera flash to make your images 
feel softer and give more warm wraparound light rather than just being like the in-your-face spotlight like you see right here. Um, it's kind of the way to go as a brand image overall. All right, here is the image that we took, and this is, as you'll see tomorrow when we go through all the editing, uh, this is with my preset 2019 color preset, the basic one that I use pretty much for everything. And uh, I'm pretty happy with it overall. Again, as I said, very contrasty, very in your face, like wow, off camera light. Um, so use that at your discretion. Don't overuse it. As soon as you start to get good and you start to see good results, the tendency is to just use it as much as possible and kind of dial yourself back once you feel like you're maybe going a little bit too far. Spoiler, I maybe went too far here. What's up? We're outside now. I like to shoot outside images and images that you'd usually be like, oh, I need my wide angle lens to photograph that scene uh, with something like an 85 and figure out how you have to frame it and where you have to be in order to create the thing that you want. So here are some examples that I shot with a longer lens that also could have been shot with a, with a 24 or 28 or 35. But I feel like shooting with a longer lens makes it feel a little bit more professional. It gives it a little, little something a little bit unique. Midday review of the shoes. Wish that I would have found these years and years and years ago. Do yourself a favor right now, go out and find some great dress shoes that are also kind of running shoes, rather than wearing just dress shoes or wearing just running shoes. That was my message from back in June when we were allowed to go outside and we were allowed to go to weddings with lots of people. My usual strategy for doing photos here is pretty much that I'll go around the room with a wider lens. I'll get, uh, especially if there's nobody in the room right now, which is very, very rare, I will get as many of the wider shots as I possibly can when the opportunity is available. And then I will switch to my 85 and I'll get kind of close ups of pretty much anything that's been brought in for the wedding. In my mental priority list, the way this goes is that I'm happy to have a second photographer go out and do all the detail shots of the day. I feel like it's, um, it's almost selfish of me that if I'm uh, right now the couple's not actually at the venue, but if I was sacrificing time to go and shoot details when I could be capturing moments with their close friends and family, I would prefer to be doing that. Um, but because they're not here yet, I'm just kind of going around the going around the room. And I guess to to expand on that, one of the reasons that I think it is a little bit selfish to to go and do this is because, at least in my mindset, when I'm photographing details very heavily, it is because I want the wedding to get published. And if that's not something that is the dream of your couple and you're wasting kind of their valuable time that you could be creating great images for them and you are out creating images for yourself to get exposure and to get published, um, it's I feel like it's a selfish it's a selfish thing. That all said, I feel like most couples probably do. They would be pretty happy if their wedding got published and it's maybe not something that they would ever think could ever happen. As I said in the beginning, my full off-camera course for wedding photographers is available on Patreon the first week of April. Um, and it walks you through a little bit more of how I approach everything. My strategy for the most part is using off-camera flash to just make things a little bit better. So as you can see, the light is actually really, really good. Um, but by adding a little bit more and by adding just a little bit of that spotlight, I really did kind of make the image a little bit better. And as I said, tomorrow we'll be editing all these images, but also this month on Patreon, I'm doing a full editing course for wedding photographers as well. So if you're interested in that, there's a heck of a lot going on over there. Uh, this looks so good. I'm very happy. Now, working with a video team can be a little bit stressful from time to time. If you're a wedding photographer, or you have such limited time and to have somebody else have to go in and, and orchestrate other events is really, really stressful. I think that the best thing you can do is to pre-coach your couples. Usually if they are at the first meeting and they're hiring a photographer, there's a pretty good chance, I would say a 98% chance, every now and then it does happen, um, that you're gonna be hired before the video team. So any advice that you can give them in that moment, know that they're gonna take that forward and when they're booking a video team, because in the for the most part, I think every one of my couples, the video team is always kind of secondary, at least to photography, um, that my couple is always like, Taylor's kind of the boss here and whatever he says goes. And I feel like when they are told at least to kind of encourage that dynamic or to, to make sure that we can at least talk about it in advance or for them to just kind of be like, hey, our vision for the day is that our video is just all candid behind the scenes moments. Please don't pose us. Please don't make us run. Please don't make us jump. In that case, usually you find yourself getting just hooked up with much better video teams that you actually enjoy working with that actually come up with good ideas that you can also kind of get the candid shots from. One of the reasons that I actually do kind of enjoy working with a video team is because I get to essentially second shoot 
as a main shooter for a little bit. So they take control, they, they do some stuff, and I can get on my 85 or my 7200, and I can be getting candid moments of people, of kind of like those, the top members of the wedding party and the family, uh, all in good lighting, because they're hopefully they're shooting in good light, but also just like, acting normal and not necessarily something that I'm posing. I, I don't like the attention. As I said in the, the beginning, I'm very quiet and introverted and I would rather just other people just live their lives and let me document what happens. And I feel like by working with a video team, you actually kind of get some of that. Um, you get to second shoot for yourself, which is kind of cool. So um, I usually there's like maybe one or two uh, like examples per year that kind of stress me out or something that they do that they just don't think about. But for the most part, by pre-coaching your couples and getting them on the same page as you with their video team, they can give their video team expectations and make your wedding day a heck of a lot better for you. That said, you're still gonna have to communicate with them and um, like, for instance, later in this video, you'll see that he just kind of sets up a tripod right in the center of the aisle and it's like, uh, it's kind of unfortunate, but at the same time, like I can kind of work around it and it's not the the biggest deal. So the more you can talk and the more you're kind of just civil with each other, um, the, the better the overall day is going to be um, 100%. That said, there are some nightmare situations, unfortunately, that the video crew is just like, this didn't happen today, but um, that they're just like so far in the opposite direction of kind of how you want to photograph and document the day that it really does make your work suffer significantly. Um, I've noticed that when people bring in a lot of lighting, when there's just always that like that orange light on top of their camera. Um, this is kind of maybe the older school videographers, most newer age people are all just kind of shooting ambient as, as I would um, in photography, but there are those times that they really can have a huge negative impact in the day. So make sure your couple is at least a little bit aware of that without being like, don't hire a video team, hire me to do both instead. Um, if they wanna hire a video team, like they can do that, but just make sure that they know at least a few of the key points to just kind of tell the video team like, hey, don't come in and set up 22 lights and don't put that big mobile tripod on wheels in the center of the aisle for the entire aisle and don't bring a huge steady cam vest and be elbowing the photographer out of the way. Um, so just by telling them a little bit in advance, usually you can alleviate any problems actually on the wedding day, um, at least in my experience. And over time, it seems to have gotten better the more that I've somehow been able to kind of convince them and tell them of the, the troubles that I've had, um, that they can instantly kind of diagnose that. So uh, back to the wedding day. So now I'm going to let the video team do what they need to do. And I'm going to use this as a little bit of kind of a mental break that I'm still going to be taking images and I'm going to figure out how I'm going to light the next shot. Um, so I'm bringing the light behind over here so that I'm kind of almost using it as a hair light. And I'm going to go behind where the bridesmaids are over there. Sorry, the 360 camera. I stopped using it because whenever I, I move like that, it gets a little weird and jelloey and it makes me feel a little ill from time to time. Um, so I promise this is the last 360 wedding day video until they, they figure out um, maybe how to stitch it a little bit better. By having off camera light, the other huge benefit is that you're just able to kind of circle around and you're able to find different frames within the scene that you're in and not be at the mercy of having your light on your camera where you always have to kind of be in the same spot. Getting the light away so that I'm able to get a little bit of a wider shot and I'm gonna start just kind of going back and making different frames out of all of the tables. And even if you wanna look out towards the window for one or two. So as you can see that nice backlight coming in and not overpowering the scene, I could have easily turned this up to one and just kind of made it or one to one power and really overpowered with it. But I feel like by just having it subtly in there, it makes a much better frame. And now I can get even further back. And again, shooting with an 85, you can create some different frames within the scene that you would not normally see. Natural frames, frames, interlinked. Here's a clip. Photographer TJ6-3.7. Let's begin. Ready? Yes, sir. Recite your baseline. A system of frames of the yellow mirror list began to spin. A system of frames interlink within frames interlink within frames interlink within one stem. Frames dreadfully distinct against the dark. Frames. frames. Does your camera make frames? Frames. Frames. Do you use natural frames? Frames. Frames. Interlinked. Interlinked. Are technology and creative interlinked? Interlinked. Interlinked. Japan and photography are interlinked? Interlinked. Interlinked. Within frames interlinked. Within frames interlinked. Why don't you say that three times? Within frames interlinked. Within frames interlinked. Within frames interlinked. We're done. You can pick up your mirrorless. Thank you. Anytime I hear the word frames, that's all I think about now, or the word interlinked, but that, that word doesn't really come up too often in my day-to-day -day life. 
but I feel like I say frames every day and I'm just slowly trying to poison you into every time you hear the word frames to think of that clip over time. It'll, it'll be a three year process playing the long game here. Um, I think to talk a little bit about natural frames, uh, not to just keep referencing back to the video, but the natural frame I feel like is the wedding photographer, the, like the best, the best friend of a wedding photographer. Um, one, because it makes for better images, it makes for compositions. And when I talk about natural frames, it's just finding things to kind of like frame a scene. Like if I were to do this and then maybe there was like something like this, just like off in the foreground. You make it prettier if it was like flowers or something. Um, but by just having those natural frames and by making, images kind of compose better. You can also hide elements that you don't want. And on a wedding day, there are so many elements around that I do not want. When I walk into that getting ready room, there is just so much stuff all over because there's so many people in such a small space usually that if I can use natural frames or I can bring in things or you can even use your phone, you can use the glossy surface of your phone. Like if you do something like this, you can start to reflect things. Um, maybe don't reflect the ceiling, but if there's something interesting happening up there, like a tree or something, you can bring that back into the scene so that you get rid of everything that's back here. Or you don't want that bookshelf that you can, maybe maybe this won't work so well, but if you don't want that bookshelf, you can, that didn't work at all. It's important to try things. We, we tried and we failed together right there. Um, but natural frames, always something that I am looking for on wedding day. And I'm using them in the form of kind of a traditional thing that you think of, like a window frame shooting out there, like perfect, but also with bushes kind of coming into the side of scenes and just making life look a little bit more interesting, I guess, and having some foreground elements that are out of focus um, as they drift back into the in-focus frames um, or into the in-focus scene, I feel like it just makes for a better frame overall. So I've said the word frames too many times. Let's get back to not saying the word frames for the rest of the video. And as close as everyone can get together, the better. And maybe anger yourself in just a little bit more. That's good there. And my flash is a little too overpowered when you start to see it kind of leaking through like that and actually making shadows because now it is more people in the scene. Uh, I don't really like that. So let's dial that back down a little bit and try it again. This looks fantastic. All right, that's a little more balanced. And again, you can see kind of that small little tiny outline that's almost turning into a purple fringe a little bit. Uh, that's because of this lens. And when you shoot it wide open and you get those harsh contrast points, you start to see a little bit of purple. <laughs> you, learn to, you learn to work with it and you learn to see when it's gonna happen and um, mitigate the, uh, the purple fringe. And at a time that off camera flash and being able to just create kind of a mock studio environment just with a single light, like this uh, really does come in handy is when you're photographing anyone with a bald head because if we're out in the bright sun today I really do have to do my best to find shade um, or her dad's head's gonna be quite uh, quite a different uh, shade of just pure white um, but by doing that inside here and doing the family photos in this room setting up that one light to make things just look a little bit better and a little bit more professional overall is definitely the best thing you can do with your time. I'm always capitalizing whenever there's good light and good things going on, whether that is for candids or whether that is for family photos. If I have everyone there, I'm going to do it is when, when I'm in a good situation. And because we do still have a little bit of time, I'm going to do a few more photos and just kind of experiment and turn the flash power up a lot more than it was before and create even more of a spotlight kind of in the center of that floor from behind. Pop. As you can see, still pretty balanced, but a lot more light coming in from behind and kind of getting on that veil. It almost looks a little bit like a skylight or something coming in. So recreating light that should exist in the scene or could potentially exist in the scene, I feel like is always the way to go by just creating like if I was to just put two flashes right like on over her left and right shoulder and just point them right back at the camera. That might look like a cool image, but I feel like it's not a very wedding photography appropriate image. Or there is a time for it if you're doing dances and whatever, um, like in the actual dance party section that you can do a lot more flashes into the camera. But for just typical wedding day, I try to minimize and I try to create lighting that should exist in the real world. Goodbye, natural frame frames. One thing that I will point out right now, if you are not a follower of my channel, one, subscribe. Two, you've probably seen me shoot pretty much every ceremony that I've ever shot on a 7200. The reason I do this is because it allows me to maintain the most amount of fly on the wall status while also getting all the shots I need. I would love to shoot a ceremony with an 85 prime, but there are just so many people here that I'd be crawling over people trying to get the shot and I don't want to do that. So if I can have the extra zoom with this lens, 7200 I think is a absolutely critical lens for any wedding photographer to have, especially if you're shooting larger weddings overall. Um, and you don't have to go out and buy one right now. Don't buy one just on my recommendation because they're 
they're expensive. Like it took me a, many, many years to actually decide to purchase one. And what I did in the meantime is there are a lot of websites that you can go on and you can rent them for the weekend and you can rent a 7200. Just make sure you get your order in early because they will have limited quantities of them. Um, but you're able to rent one and play around with it. And I feel like in the beginning, that lens rental really did step my portfolio up. And while I was investing like that $100 or whatever to rent it for a weekend or maybe $150, uh, the way that that money came back to me was by generating just better portfolio and better wedding day coverage overall. So it made my clients happier, more likely to get referrals, more likely to get those amazing images and just get images that I could not get on my own just with my 85 millimeter lens, even though I absolutely would have loved to. So let's go to the wedding day with Timothy Musa joined by on my left-hand side right now. This week on Island of Photographers. <laughs> that was the best thing. <laughs> This week on Survivor Island of Photographers, three photographers photograph a 30 guest wedding. Who will be voted off the island? Will it be Marshall who wears a shirt in the swimming pool? Tim who seduces a young mariachi named Andreas? Or Taylor who just won't stop photographing clouds? Then, 10 minutes before the ceremony, rain. Find out how it ends on this week's episode of Survivor Island of Photographers. This is New Island of Photographers. All right. Welcome to the ceremony. The ceremony is, I don't know if it's the hardest or the easiest. It's a part of the wedding day. Um, that's my official review of photographing a ceremony. A lot of my frames are vertical because I do try to minimize as many distractions as I can in the frame. So if I am shooting a horizontal image, there's going to be a lot of people's faces and just like three of those people's faces not facing into the scene. I feel like really distract from an image and I have to get into cropping and all kinds of craziness like that. I would rather just shoot vertical, get the people in kind of full focus and get full length shots of everyone coming down the aisle. I feel like this is a time to just kind of document as the day goes, um, rather than trying to create anything like really crazy and artistic. Uh, I, I'm not going to set up an off-camera flash here to do anything. And I don't suggest that you do either. There's actually an off-camera wedding day in this exact same space where it was nighttime and had to shoot everything at 5,000 ISO. So if you're interested in seeing this in less ideal conditions, there is a video on my YouTube channel. And I think there's like 25 or 26 uh, full wedding days now. So you can get your get your fill of the, of the wedding days. And a lot of them involve... Uh, music videos for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I can't change them now because they're online and that's that's how they live forever. You can't update videos here, unfortunately. That's my review. Back to the wedding day. I was photographing off to the left there, but my 360 camera just kind of stays pointed straight. It's one of the meta many benefits of the 360 camera. The main negative is that it takes me about 100 hours now to do, and maybe not 100, but it takes me a long time to do these full wedding days with the 360 camera because I have to reframe everything and I have to first collect all the footage and put it back to you. Don't care. You're, you're here. You're watching the video. I shouldn't complain to you. I appreciate you being here. Here's all the images of everybody coming down the aisle. Again, as I said, just basic documentary coverage. Full lengths are nice. Vertical frames to keep everybody out of just kind of the, the sides um, looking weird or looking at different people or distracting from the, the scene or even just looking at their watch or their phone or whatever. Also, I lied to you. Those are not full length shots. Um, for the guys, I rarely, if ever, get the full length shot because it doesn't. it's not really as important. For the girls, I try my best to get the full dress because I feel like they care about that. I feel like all of the interest in a guy's suit really kind of ends just above the belly button. So usually that's kind of where where my frames end with them, whether I'm shooting vertical or whether I'm shooting horizontal. I never love just kind of standing up here at the front, but it's kind of a thing that I have to do. Um, I would much prefer to be hidden somewhere, but this is unfortunately the frame that I have to get um, from everybody because it's the, it's, it's the shot, so I, I can't not be here. All right, as I said, full length-ish for the girls when possible. Here's a full length. Ah, not quite, almost, getting closer. I feel like that's kind of a more proper crop though. Um, with the guys, I'm definitely a lot tighter than that. I'll let this roll for a minute. So you just kind of see the, the things. This is one of the things that helped me, I think the most when I was first getting started, I watched Jerry Gionis do a few of these that just had a person just kind of rolling coverage. He didn't talk over it at all. It was just like as the wedding day happened and it made me a lot, I don't know, just happier going into a wedding day knowing what a wedding actually looked like because prior to photographing a wedding, I had not been to a wedding since I was like essentially the this kid's age five or so. Um, this is me shooting over to the left of the groom, just his reaction. Um, I know that Tim is getting the shot of the kids and I want to do my best to get 
the groom's reaction shot when he first sees his bride for the first time. Um, so I got that shot and I'm going to get another shot while they're out in kind of the bright sun. Again, capitalizing on those times where the light is bad, I'm going to just photograph whatever is good or whatever's possibly good within that scene. Um, well, kind of catching a few safe shots to make sure at least that I have something in case I need it. Um, so this is photographing over here. It's kind of cool that the camera stays just pointed that way. You can see what I didn't see in real life. Um, and a lot of time I'll actually shoot kind of over my shoulder. So if I have to like peer around a corner, I'll be kind of photographing the groom, uh, like no look style and waiting for the bride to come around, especially if it's a short aisle. Um, so that I can just quickly flip around and get a shot. Um, since in this case, like her, her dad, um, are kind of the most important. I know Tim's up front there, so I'm going to do a little, little walksy down the aisle. I feel like this is the only time that I really kind of go in that front aisle space is, um, when everyone's standing at. I feel more comfortable doing it. Um, getting this shot here, Tim's getting the close-ups of people's faces. And I like this shot because it kind of frames everyone and it shows that there's something going on. Once everyone sits down, it's just kind of like, I don't know, it just it's boring, I guess. It's a very ceremony-esque shot. Here, I feel like there's, there's more going on. So I do the best that I can to photograph everything in that moment um, that I possibly can. And there are a few bonus images that I didn't show on the screen there because I wanted to show you kind of my flow of how things happen there um, in the editing section tomorrow. So you'll see a few more images kind of from that moment um, in editing tomorrow. Here we go. Getting shots. My key shots to get now, whether I'm shooting photo or video, are usually kind of just a wide shot of all the girls standing, a wide shot of all the guys, or if it's guys, girl side, or girl, guys, guys side, whatever it is. I want everybody standing on the left and everybody standing on the right in kind of a one photo. Um, and I'm usually cropped in just on the, the groomsmen or bridesmaids rather than including the, the bride and groom in them. Um, then I'm doing all variations that I can possibly think of that it's not really something that I write down. It's just that I want a shot of the like good shots close up of the groom looking at the bride in this case and the bride looking at the groom. So I'll kind of go from side to side as you'll see and I'll get those shots. And I do my best to, uh, I'm fortunate because I know a lot of the, the people that officiate, the officiants, the priests, the ministers, and I kind of know where their jokes are. A lot of them kind of say the same things over and over again. So I know when they're kind of gearing up for a punchline. Um, and when I know that that's coming, I get myself in a position to first get that one shot that I want of, of the bride and that one shot of the groom. Um, so I kind of wait for those and that's the thing that just comes with experience and time, but usually you can kind of read a ceremony and you can get a feel for somebody. And if they're a little bit of a joke teller, um, <laughs> this is such a weird 360 camera angle, <laughs> little face crunched there. Um, you can usually get a feel for it and you can usually kind of predict when people are going to laugh and smile so that you're not just like behind your camera pointed at people waiting the entire ceremony. And because uh, as I kind of punched in earlier to talk about um, the video guy is in the center of the aisle here, but we actually talked about it before and I was like, can you just give me the first like 45 seconds and then post up um, or in a better situation, a better life case would be if they were able to just have a, a longer lens and to sit at the far back with a tall tripod above everyone on a 7200. That is the most ideal, obviously, but not everyone comes prepared to do that. From this angle here, this is my shot. I am all the way in at 200, and then I actually go into crop mode within my camera, so I'm shooting kind of at 300. <laughs> I feel like I'm a South Park character whenever I can see myself in the 360 frame. Uh, for the first kiss, I'm always focus point and focus locked on exactly where they are, and I'm just sitting waiting for that to happen. And uh, then I just grab the frames that I need, and then they walk back down the aisle usually. And to give you a sense of how I'm handling that bright light that's behind, because they're in the shade and it's just bright sunny day outside and specifically on that piece behind them um, is that that's I'm just doing the best I can with it because it's really a photographically challenging situation but now it's a little bit cloudy and it makes my life just just a little bit easier and I would say working with a video team this is probably the most challenging part of the entire wedding day is just when they're coming back down the aisle um, Tim also already feels awkward about it <laughs> kind of stepped into his usual spot and he's like oh can't be there uh, because they're gonna track back so I'm gonna do the best I can to kind of get that shot from where I'm at and dodge this person with her phone and um, just kind of do the best that I can in that scene. And Tim's getting that wide shot and I'm kissing fortunately because uh, I missed it. That's why it's important to have, well, I got it, but I got it from way too close. Uh, so that's why it's important to have a second photographer. And if you are a second photographer, that's why it's important to just not stand on top of your lead shooter if you are photographing and be in a different spot. And if possible, be on a slightly different lens. Like if you're both shooting a 7200 and you're both at the exact same spot, there's really, there's really no need for that. Let's take a little break. We're talking a lot. I hope that you've been enjoying the content so far. The break right now is just to demonstrate that I can turn my, my light off and on with the remote. 
and it, it just makes me really happy. Something that I should mention here is second shooter rules. So I touched on it briefly there that if you're if you're with a second shooter and you're the second shooter, uh, don't be on top of the other person. Or if you're a lead shooter, maybe uh, creatively mention that maybe they should be somewhere else. Or if you see them on the same lens, kind of switch it up a little bit. A few other things to maybe be cautious of if you are second shooting for someone else is that uh, personally, maybe your lead shooter might be different if you're second shooting for them, maybe ask them. Um, but I find that if somebody's shooting specifically during family formals that we're about to get into, if you're the second photographer, don't be just shooting the same image over top of my shoulder. Um, I have two cards on my camera. I have that level of backup. Um, at that point, it makes sense to go to cocktail hour. Tim specifically is amazing because he is very, I guess we're similar personalities, but he does um, more extroverted things, I think. And one of the things that he does that I find very beneficial as somebody that doesn't um, ever do this because it's just, it's just one, I don't have the time because I'm doing other things at the wedding with the couple and with the family. Um, but he just goes out into cocktail hour and anyone that looks like they're like good friends, that they're hanging out, they're having a good time, he'll just walk up and be like, Hey guys, do you mind if I take a photo? And he just comes back with not only good candid photographs from cocktail hour, which are important, but also just kind of like little stage, like arm around each other, smile, face the camera of a bunch of just different random couples. And as far as value goes, I feel like that is the most valuable thing that he could be doing in that time that getting a lot of candid photos, that's great and all that like, oh cool, like your uncle's laughing. But by having images that couples can frame and print and of the bridesmaid and their significant others, a groomsman, significant other, whatever it might be, by coming back with those photos, he really just kind of goes to the next level as a second photographer as far as creating value for, for myself. So um, I appreciate that. And I think that if you're a second photographer, um, that that is just figure out what you, the most valuable thing you can be doing in any given moment is and just go out and do it. Um, a few other things, a few random red flags that I've discovered kind of over time for second shooters is one, when you're hired to be a second, don't be giving out your own business cards. You are working for the other person. If, if somebody's asking for a business card, asking for your contact, asking for your Instagram, um, be giving out the lead photographer that's been hired to be there. Um, there are exceptions, of course, but communicate with your lead shooter and don't just like start giving out your own Instagram at the wedding and trying to like poach business from them. Um, cause that relationship just really isn't going to end well. So, um, that's kind of the, the, one of the only things that I see happening quite often. Um, but again, like you're working for somebody else, figure out how to make as much value for them as possible. And to be maybe a little, I guess, depending on what the situation is that sometimes the lead shooter, when you're a second will not allow you at all to use any of the images that you photograph or to Instagram story that you're even at a wedding. Um, I personally am cool with my seconds using whatever images they want, but that said, don't just use it as a license to just go out and create for your own portfolio that at the end of the day, you're still there to make good value and to create basically the fill in the holes where places that the lead shooter can't be. And if they can't be at cocktails cause they're doing family formals, go into cocktails and just like absolutely knock it out of the park, even though cocktails, I, I don't know if this is for everybody, but it's a hundred percent for me. Um, it's like just the, the hardest part for me to go in and do what I ever feel like is a good job at. Um, so if you can go in there and you can kind of fill in the gaps and the weaknesses of your lead shooter, they're going to be very happy to have you around a lot. Um, and then that also comes down the line. And when they start being booked for weddings, that if they, they start referring you, so like somebody inquires for July 22nd and, and they're booked, once they start seeing you kind of as somebody that actually creates a lot of good value, I guess it could go both ways. One, they could be super protective and be like, no, I need to keep this person as a second. Uh, but I feel like most reasonable people will just be like, no, nah, like it's time to pass along some of the, some of the work to somebody else uh, and find somebody else to come in and fill their second role. Um, everybody knows that kind of at least in 90, I'm going to say like 98% of cases that if you're second shooting, you're doing that to build the skills and to build um, a future business. And a lot, like all photographers are going to understand that. There's a few that um, really just only want to come in a second and that's awesome too. But at some point your lead shooter will kind of understand that like this is the natural progression of things that it's time for you to start kind of doing your own thing that you're by far qualified. And as somebody that shoots a lot of weddings, knowing that when I do refer somebody that has like, if they come in my email box and they're like, Taylor, we've been following you for like five years. We absolutely want you to shoot our wedding. Um, how do we do that? We're getting married July 31st of this year. And I'm like, well, I'm booked. I want to refer them to somebody that kind of carries on the values of my business. I don't want to just refer them to some random person. Um, I guess I'm in a special case cause I can just refer them to my wife, Lindsay, um, or Tim or, um, somebody else that we're like good friends with. But for the most part, I would rather refer to somebody that I know is going to do a good job and maybe 
I, I guess this is depending on mindset of the person and scarcity mindset and if they're really protective over their business, maybe they're not. Like there's some people that are not going to refer to somebody that's actually gonna knock a wedding out of the park. Hopefully the person that you're second shooting for is somebody that's kind of a good person and is happy to see you go on and succeed in the future. But by following those simple rules, create value and don't give out your own stuff at and like promote yourself on the wedding day um, is kind of the way to do it. Um, and then even promoting yourself, I feel like comes down to like, don't get home and just like add all the bride and the bridesmaids all to Instagram and start following them um, without the permission kind of of your lead shooter. So those are my helpful tips for today. Hopefully helpful. Let's get back to the uh, voiceover, my natural frame. All right, um, lighting wise, it's the best if you're facing me kind of this way. Um, so if you guys are kind of like up in this spot here, we can just put all family around you and try not to move you too much. So the easiest way to do family formals is to find a big patch of shade, kind of like what I'm standing in, but if they're standing where I'm standing, there's really no place for me to take photos. I'm standing at like the craft services table in, in the parking lot um, with already placed cars. So this is kind of the best spot that I can find. And I think the best location is usually if, if the sun is at their back and then also their background is in the shade. So usually if the sun is coming directly from behind them, it would probably put those rocks in the shade. Today, we don't really have that opportunity, but I'm hoping that we'll get a little bit of cloud cover at least for a few minutes. And if you want to hear kind of a lot more of my interactions and a lot more of what I talk to couples about uh, on Patreon, the introvert's guide to wedding photography posing is kind of everything that I know about that. And what a wonderful time we got some cloud cover. And here is a side by side comparison left is obviously in the sun. It's an okay image. It would have been fine, but on the right is the shade heck of a lot nicer really in every single way. So always find shade when you can today got very lucky. And I feel like whenever there is shade that even if I'm doing family photos, I kind of move all the family out or I move the couple if there's mobility issues and we go out and we do as many photos as we can quickly in the shade, especially when I have to do photos kind of at 2.30 in the afternoon like we are today. Um, the other option is to do the majority of the couple photos later in the evening if, if it looks like it's going to be a good weather day and that you're going to get a nice sunset or something like that that yield wise, you can get so many more photos of just the couple in that time frame than you can right now. And even if I had three hours with them right now, I could make some good images, but 10 minutes of time, I can create more images than I would be able to create within that time frame. and just lighting. And I guess that's also goes back to my style as well, that I, I want those nice, soft, warm lit wraparound light images. Um, if you want something more harsh, if you want to bring in some off camera light and you want to put up a scrim or something to get rid of the direct sun, like by all means, if that's, if that's your thing. But for me specifically to just work in kind of that golden hour light, I can get a lot done, not even in 10 minutes. I can get a lot done in three minutes of good light in that time. All right. As you can see, the shade is nice. The shade. So basically the, the only negative or the only negative that I can see uh, when it gets cloudy at this time of the day is that you lose a little bit of the saturation from everything. So if you're in a big open field, you're going to lose a little bit of that green because the sunlight just brings out the green in a different way when the sun gets all the way down to the root of the grass and there's just more color there. But I think overall for the, I guess like my thing is that I was, I want to make people look as good as they possibly can. And soft light, open shade, open shade specifically when you're not in a forest. If you're in a forest and it's complicated, we'll talk about that in a few minutes here. Um, but just like this nice shade with all these kind of neutral textures around that are bouncing light and making it nice and essentially building me a nice little studio with kind of all the direction of lighting that I want. Um, I'm very happy to have that. And here's an example of when it gets a little bit sunnier. I think the main thing to do when it gets sunnier like this is to go a little bit wider. I'm still on my 7200 only because the video team's doing some work here, but I think by going really, really nice and wide, getting all that blue sky, getting those clouds in really does kind of make a better image overall. And it's kind of the best that you can do within these conditions given. And if the couple's very small and they're not looking at the camera, like the, the worst case would be to just have them trying to face into the camera and smile and look at you when they're being bleached out by the sun. But if they are kind of small and just kind of hugging each other and just nice and close together, you can get away with a lot more. Uh, I don't know what the official gray area response is. If a video team setting something up, I'm going to shoot it because I'm there on the wedding day. If I can get extra images, I don't care if it's their setups. Um, I feel like morally, maybe there's some sort of artistic license there that people might get upset by that. Like if there's say for instance, they're for whatever 
reason there was two lead shooters. I probably wouldn't shoot what they're shooting because I feel like that's a conflict and more of a theft. But when the video team's just setting stuff up, um, I'm happy to photograph as much as I can within that scene that they're trying to do. And it's always going to look a lot different. And I'm kind of waiting for almost the in-between takes moments. So if they're asking them to do something, when they stop is when I usually am kind of taking those images when they're actually interacting with one another. All right, so the big thing for me is to photograph with as much light coming into the scene as possible. I don't want them facing into the forest. I want them facing out of the forest to get the best possible light. So uh, in this case, they're backlit, which is nice. There's this huge piece of sun that's reflecting a little bit of light back. And we're kind of at the entrance to this uh, forest here. So they're not just all in green. Now you might be asking yourself, what does it look like when you add off camera flash to an outside scene in the forest and add an unnecessary light that doesn't exist in real life? This is what it looks like. And I'll leave it to you to decide whether you like it or not. It's a, it's a thing. Um, I went for it today because I've been using a lot of off-camera flash and I feel like it still fits within uh, the gallery, the set of the images. On a normal wedding day, I just wouldn't bring this out of the blue and just use it out of absolutely nowhere. But I am happy with that image. I am probably a little bit more happy with the image without that flash. So uh, we didn't spend too much time experimenting with that. Tomorrow in editing, you'll see how wildly overexposed that image was, but it all it all comes back. You got the dynamic range, and it shouldn't. It, in JPEG, that is not an image that would have come back. But uh, fortunately, shoot raw. Um, just a shout out to to raw for its creation. Tomorrow uh, in the editing video, I'll show you how I kind of overcame that last scene because it, everything was just green, and you have to do a lot of color correction. But fortunately, once you get it correct, it's just okay. simple as copying and pasting, kind of between all of the images that are affected by that same crazy color. This is a much happier image when it comes to uh, color, but the dynamic range in the background makes it a little bit more challenging. That said, I'm always exposing and making the people look as good as possible, and I'm not too worried if the background becomes just like a little bit too hot because there's a pretty good chance that the couple is going to be looking at themselves and not at the, at the background. And as weird as it is, I would rather shoot in a little patch of shade like this with good quality of light everywhere and uh, be, I don't know, it's a little bit weird, it's in a parking lot, but it, it works and we found the shade and everything kind of comes together. I get them to walk and as soon as they're in the sun, I just give up because that's a pointless shot as of that point. All right, moving into the reception uh, is usually there's basically within at least an, a normal summer day here, there's a lot of dynamic progression during a reception and just during those couple of hours. Everyone usually sits down maybe two hours before sunset and then the entire room changes over that entire period of time. So having off camera flash really does help you out a lot, at least to maintain some level of consistency. Uh, personally, I like it when kind of all the speeches kind of go in specific chunks. So the first speeches that go off are just in regular, almost daylight. And then the next set that go off maybe are in kind of that weird half and half time that you got to convert everything to black and white. And then the final speeches are all incandescent and a lot easier to handle. Um, know that even as somebody that's photographed, I think 800, plus weddings at this point, that it is still really, really incredibly challenging to tackle that kind of ambient moment where it's kind of still sunny, but there's some just gross incandescent lights going on. And depending on which way people look, it just becomes a completely different image. So by using a little bit of off-camera flash, you can kind of put light back into the places that, that need to have that good quality light, but know that there's no way that you're gonna make everything look kind of studio quality throughout the entire progression of a reception. Oh yes, here comes Tim. Did you forget that Tim was here? He was at cocktails, creating amazing memories for the people of the wedding. And that sounds like a joke, but it's, it's kind of true. I'm now gonna leave my face in here for some comedic value, because I look like a cartoon character all of a sudden. When people are coming in, I usually use the, the first couple groups as at least a little bit of a test to figure out how to get the best image of the couple coming in. If the couple is the only People being introduced, it really puts all the weight on it, and you just kind of do the best you can. Again, these might these aren't going to be the images that end up posted like huge on the wall for the most part, and you're just doing the best you can to document what actually happens. It's a documentary image. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to just like make this the best image of the entire day because you're never going to get there, unfortunately. And I'm still not there, and I've been doing this a while. This is one of the moments that I usually get as many candidates as I possibly can because I know that people are excited. They're just they're, they're in faces and in a mental state that they're not going to be in for the rest of dinner because everyone's just going to sit down and just 
start eating. Um, so for this moment here, as many candidates as I possibly can of all of the key people, usually you know who the key people are at this point in the day, and just really focus on them, and obviously get all the shots you need of the couple as well. Um, I have my off-camera light set up across the dance floor that is being obstructed currently and shooting behind somebody, but during the first dance you'll see um, it actually have a little bit of an effect on kind of what we're doing. For the first dance, I'm usually on my 85, or in this case, I could have easily been on my 70 to 200 because I have more than enough space to get around, and I, I don't love to just be standing in front of people, and with that lens, I can get a little bit closer and kind of get the moments that I need. If I was shooting video on this day as well, I would 100% have been on my 70 to 200 at this time of the day. As I spoke to earlier, uh, Tim knows that I'm on my 85, so he is on his 35, and he is getting all the images, the wide-angle images that I need uh, of specifically just the dry ice that kind of came out of nowhere. We saw a machine and then all of a sudden it was just producing this. So uh, no official warning to that. Had there been a little bit of warning, I might have done something. I might have got maybe one off camera light a little bit lower um, to just try to get all the, the maximum texture possible off of the, the dry ice, off the smoke. Um, but for now, I'm just kind of going with that nice soft look and feel. Uh, I do have my off camera light pointed directly back at me, kind of at mid mid human height. Um, so whenever they kind of turn to their side here, you'll actually see my light come directly in between the two of them. That's an effect that you can do or you cannot do. It's completely up to you. I think during the daytime, it's a bit of a weird effect, but I think at nighttime it becomes a, a lot better of a thing. And again, the thing that I like about off camera flash is that I can circle around anywhere and my flash is still going off and making the light that I would like. Um, this is a much better situation, I guess, like right now ambient, I could have shot this no problem, but as it gets darker, uh, it's much nicer to be able to just go wherever I want in order to get the shot. And as you see, is that a natural frame? So just using people's heads to kind of make some sort of frame out of that. And I'm pretty happy with the result. All right, it is dinner time, and the light right now is actually really good in the venue, so I'm not going to be setting up too much off-camera lighting for speeches and for the parent dances, but once the light starts to go down a little bit further, I will be setting up two off-camera flashes. Yeah. I'm going to play around a little bit with uh, both just creating great natural-looking light and then also creating something a little bit more dramatic. You don't have to go too far, not even really past those rocks there. That's perfect. And if you want to turn around and slowly walk back towards us and you guys can look at each other and pretend we're not just obviously here creeping and be really unreasonably happy with each other. Awesome. Cool. And if you want to stand there for one second. Perfect. And even if you want to kind of close your eyes and kind of turn into them, I don't know if that's super weird, but I promise it looks like perfect magazine. Amazing. I might move you guys just to the back kind of center there. Right there is good. And if you just want to put both arms around each other and get really close one more time, you can dip her if you want. If you're feeling confident. Yeah. All right, leaning into the sun and just kind of absorbing all the flare that I can. I like to have this flare. Uh, if this is in your taste, don't shoot this way, but I think it makes a very nice image. And I think that as a marketing image, that's a very good image as well. I'm going to talk quickly about the styles of images that I create. So first and foremost, I'm always there for the couple, 100%, number one, all the time. Uh, second to that, though, I find that there are some images that I find myself using on Instagram and some images that specifically tend to convert better if used for ads for like Facebook ads or Instagram ads or even Instagram posts. And those images are images that couples don't necessarily see the face of the other couple in the image. So if I'm, if I'm a groom and I'm looking for, for a wedding photographer and I see a few images and I just like, it's just like close ups of people's faces. I feel like that's a very difficult, I, I can't picture my, my face in their face, but if I see an image of them holding hands facing away, I can start to picture myself in that image a little bit more. Or in the case of the last image that they're just almost so sunburst that or sunburst, is that a term? I don't know. They're, they're covered by the sun and the flare in a way that they're pretty obscured. So even though you can see their faces, I feel like 
it's an ambiguous or um, an anonymous image enough to be used as a great marketing image. Um, that's my personal take and my personal, I guess, testing as far as ads go that those just get way better clicks than just like a straight, amazing, perfectly lit close up of somebody that if you can create those images, um, one, like amazing images for your couple, but two, a marketing side, business side of your business, um, if you're creating those images that they're going to go a lot further for you over time that after you are finished the wedding, you're able to use that wedding to market over and over again. And then to add one more piece to that is what I spoke to a little bit earlier and kind of the, the selfish aspect of it that if you do want to get your weddings published and you are going to a wedding day and you know that there are a lot of details and you can have your second photographer capture all those details while you're photographing the family or you can bring in a third shooter just to shoot the room. We've done this a few times where it was the second photographer and I, there was just no way we could actually get to the venue and get that empty room shot. So if you want to hire somebody else to come in just to, just to get that shot, if you want to get published, it's probably worth the time and effort actually having somebody come in to do that. So something to think about. There's no official rules. There's nothing wrong with bringing a third person in to shoot the room. And um, especially if they're, so the, the girl that we usually use is an interior designer. So she knows exactly how to make rooms look amazing. Um, so I would I would love to have her come in and shoot every single room every single weekend, but uh, it's not really in the, in the budget cards, I guess. Uh, but just know that if you want to create great market images anonymous kind of style images tend to do the best and then also if you want to get published you want to get in magazines you want to get into wedding blogs the most important thing to do is to just make sure that you're making as many images as possible as just details that they can put together because a wedding magazine they're there to inspire other people they are there to inspire other couples so make sure you're creating the things that other couples can pull and pick pieces from uh, and same goes I guess for your Pinterest board that if you can put together a collective of like amazing details and people just flock to your Pinterest board, there's a pretty good chance that you're gonna book a lot of weddings off of that because you can target locally based on who's coming in. So you can target by the venue. So you can target the wineries, the local wineries or the local mills or whatever it might be. And when people are searching and you're a highly ranked Pinterest page with good clout uh, overall, that means that People come, they click, they see your images, they click to them, they stay on the page, um, and they don't immediately return to Google. If you're creating that style of work, you're really going to see a lot of return on those images or <laughs> on hiring that third shooter to come in to make sure all the details are covered. Back to Golden Hour. Right there is perfect. That's great. And I'm gonna have you guys just slowly kind of walking towards us over here. And you can just have an arm around each other for a bit and then Or if it's easier to just hold a hand while you're walking. That looks really nice too. <laughs> These are so perfect. As I mentioned earlier, just a few minutes out here in perfect lighting conditions, you can do a heck of a lot more than you can with a lot of time in less ideal lighting conditions. But you don't get golden hour like this every single day, unfortunately. Right. And then walk past us this way. Yeah. You guys can look at each other like you're just kind of... I took a lot of photos because I got very excited. I do like this photo a lot. And if you kind of turn this way just a little bit, that's good like that. Perfect. And if you want to look down at your flowers for one or two. I think it's important to always be directing while you're also shooting because the in-between shots are always the best. All right. And I'm going to do one or two of you, you too. This will be my LinkedIn profile picture. You got full rights, whatever, whatever you want, man. Whatever you want to use. No, just like that's good. Yeah. yeah, you can just look at me and be happy. Cool. All right, now we're heading back to go inside. I like to document the the transportation process. I guess I feel like it makes one a better story of the day, and two, I feel like those images just end up accidentally working out kind of the best. Uh, as you can see, I'm putting both my flashes on slave mode now. I have one. I'm actually going to move this to the other side, pointed kind of at the back of the head of whoever is presenting at one slash. 128th power and then my front flash here that's just in the middle of the dance floor is at uh, 1 slash 64 power and as you can see the backlight kind of just making a little bit more three-dimensionality and the front light keeping everything nice and clean for lighting because the lighting in here with these lights is very very challenging I'll have a few examples in the editing video tomorrow about what what's happening with the lighting and it's kind of getting good now but for the very beginning and for the very end it's very challenging to shoot with this style of LED light because they basically turn off and on very very fast so you got to keep your shutter speed very very low in order to account for that. 
Moving into dancing, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my typical off-camera light setup. Usually I'm just using one light, and for instance, in this room, I would probably be bouncing it off of this gray wall or off of this ceiling and trying to get some sort of horizontal light. So it might be like the, the typical thing to have your flash on top of your camera and to point it straight at the ceiling, but all that light's gonna come down from the ceiling and it just looks, I don't know, as a photographer, I can see when people are using that style of bounce. What I would prefer is to point a light maybe off of this wall here so that all the light comes in kind of horizontally into the scene and it adds a lot more depth and dimension into the actual image. Today I'm actually using two lights, which is very rare for me. And essentially what I'm doing is one, I'm just getting kind of the overall coverage of the scene to make everybody look good. And then with my second light, I'm kind of pointing it directly at the scene to just add a little bit of hot spots and to make it look a little bit more like a dance party and a little less like a studio overall. There is no right or wrong way to off-camera light a dance party style reception. Um, it's just all about kind of what personal taste you like. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, or at least re the the most rewarding and kind of fun thing, uh, and when you when you nail one of the shots, it's it's really really it's really, really nice, um, is when you actually are shooting directly into your flash. So you have, you're on the side of the dance floor, or for instance, like basically my flash is this blue light over here. And if I'm like this and I'm just moving away and I'm getting that nice like starburst directly into the lens while I'm standing where the camera is pointed right back. Um, when you get that nice starburst, it's very, it's a nice image to get, it's fun to do, but I don't think that you should tailor your entire style um, of off-camera lighting to just those direct lights and flashes because it's um, it's very very intense and it's very um, I feel like it's a very one one shot and you're kind of done that as soon as you get that shot It's good that it's probably um, I guess another thing is that it never really ended up in the album uh, When I used to make albums I would take the selects and those images that I was like yeah nailed it They're gonna love it never actually ended up in the album So um, that was kind of my like yeah, maybe they're not as cool as I think, what, you, you don't like fisheye shots either? No, I'm kidding, don't use a fisheye. Um, but that's kind of at least like my, my metric for if I continue to shoot the same style of images, that if I'm noticing that couples are never posting them on Instagram or they're never ending up in the album or on Facebook or whatever it might be, that I slowly kind of dial those back and I start creating images that people like. And I know that you have to have some sort of artistic Thing alive in you and, and you got to create for yourself in some points but we're also in the market of creating images that our couples want and if I'm wasting a half hour trying to get those like awesome dance party shots that they're never going to use I would rather just focus my time and energy on something that they're actually going to use and that's actually going to be valuable for them since we're hired to be there for the wedding day all right that about wraps it up my one flash is off to the right there where you can see it going off and the other one is kind of hidden up with the DJ light I think that the again like the less obtrusive I can be the better. And here is the absolute last frame that I took at this wedding before we departed. And that's just that one single light lighting them up and a little bit of direct flash coming in at a very, very low power, including the DJ lights. All right, thank you so much for joining me for this entire full wedding day. I hope that you've taken a lot of random things from this and they'll help you build your business in the future. As I always say that this is not the end all be all guide to being a wedding photographer, to pull the bits and pieces that you feel that actually fit your business or fit your style and, and plug them in. Uh, again, a reminder that this is the first week or if this is the first week of April, April 1st until April 11th, so a week in a little bit, um, that all of my courses are available on Patreon right now. So if you sign up for the $30 Patreon for one single month, you're not committed to a full year or anything crazy like that, sign up for the one month and you get instant access to everything that's on Patreon and you also get access to all of my courses that have ever been created um, going back all the way to 20 2017. So book more weddings 2017, 18, 19, 20, which are all different courses, introverts guide to wedding photography posing, as well as my advanced marketing course for wedding photographers and uh, my pricing course, the off camera flash course, as well as a bunch of podcasts. There's so much on there. It is, it is the craziest deal that I, I will never offer this deal again after this first 10, 11 days of uh, April. So if you want in on it, get it right now because it is not going to exist after that date and it will never exist again. So thank you for being here. Thank you for watching this video and hopefully you have subscribed on YouTube. And if you haven't, you can, you can subscribe on YouTube and tomorrow we're going to be getting into all the editing of this. So head over to Patreon and sign up. And even if you don't have time to write today, tonight to watch those courses that you'll have the rest of the month to watch those courses. So sign up, head over to Patreon and I will see you again tomorrow here on YouTube as well as all of the content that's over there. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.